morning. Let's see. Supposed to come up here. There we are. Good morning, everybody. It's morning for me. Don't know what time it is when you're watching this, but for me, it's good morning. And so we're on chapter 13. Let me go ahead and bring that up. Screen one. There we are. All right, so here we are. Chapter 13, personality. Going from the beginning. This is definitely one of the ones that uh, I hope to get back into the classroom for, you know, because there's quite a few things that's uh, sort of important. So we're going to cover ch ch personality chapter 13, but I also put in personality disorders, and I'll probably make a completely different lecture on that just because it needs a completely different lecture. Um, your textbook doesn't have that. It covers some personality disorders in chapter 14, and, but I think, you know, it's a chapter on personality, just like a memory, we covered dementia, you know, development, we covered, you know, some developmental disorders, um, and uh, uh, well, intellectual, we've covered intellectual disability, that sort of thing. I think it'd be worth uh, talking about personality disorders during this chapter. So that'll come later. So what is it? Personality is characteristic thoughts, emotional uh, emotional responses, behaviors, relatively stable over time and circumstances. Those are the two big uh, things. So whole persons versus individual characteristics, that's just kind of a way of dividing it up. You know, you look at the whole personality or, you know, do they have a like some particular thing or do some particular thing. Now uh, that's uh, this way of counting it up. And a trait is, uh, well, <clears throat> you know, a personality trait is, you know, maybe your style of speech, uh, maybe your assertiveness, <clears throat> maybe all that kind of stuff you know, is a trait. Why do they have Justin Bieber as an individual here? The only reason I can figure it out is that uh, people like him. I don't. <laughs> Quite the earring, though. Well, well, like, but if you like Justin Bieber, that's cool. I don't. <laughs> I try to, actually, because uh, uh, Halsey, well, I have an album of hers, and she's pretty good, and she did something with Justin Bieber. So I thought, well, it's like cognitive dissonance, and must be something good about him, and I bought some CDs, and no, I don't like him. <laughs> Here's the Gordon Alport. Uh, he basically had a th the first book on personality. That's his claim to fame. Twin in a biological basis of personality. So are there... You know, corresponding with dizygotic and monozygotic twins uh, yes so monozygotic if you remember right is the identical twin so one zygote and a zygote from a, the developmental chapters when the sperm and egg first get together and dizygote is two sperms two eggs but I want to show you something here so yes excuse me they are indeed have more correlation but even the this highest one is only not even quite 0.6. That means if you go up to 1.0, it wouldn't look as remarkable. And of course, they don't have, although the, the, the ones that are really tall, that's probably significantly statistically significant. How about this one? Well, I don't know. We don't really know. Yeah, and even that, you know, going across these lines. So yes, genetics is part of it, absolutely. And is it all of it? Absolutely not. <laughs> so. Them. But there are some things we know. You have dop uh, various dopamine receptors and novelty seeking. Those are different. Serotonin transport, anxiety, genes, impulsivity. These things we know. Okay, these things we know. Yeah, that these are part of the you know, genetics. But again, genetics is not predisposition. It's not uh, determination. So temperaments. There are different kinds of genes for temperaments. There are different kinds of ways of temperaments. About, uh, I mean. Let's see what else do I want to hear. Biologically based tendencies to feel or act in certain ways. Activity level, emotionality, and sociability. What we're going to see is these sort of things, activity level, emotionality, and sociability, those are going to go through all the different theories. Okay, those are going to go through all the different theories. And really, you know, we're going to focus a lot on the big five. You know, the big five, which is uh, this is the big five down here. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. That's the big five. And pretty much that's what people look at now. So temperaments, remember uh, the easy babies, slow to warm up and hard, uh, difficult babies back in, again, back in the developmental chapter. This is basically saying those, those traits uh, continue through adulthood, that those are actually sort of personality traits. Uh, so this, that basically is what this means. Um, socially inhibited, uh, look, yeah, it's slow to warm up, more likely to have depression and anxiety, less social support, uh, more likely to commit, um, attempt suicide again more <laughs> not holy crap determined but it's more likely and it might be like you know 
five percent more likely. I, I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's it's something to keep in mind what they when you read these. You know, so inhibited at two months, inhibited as teenagers. Again, personality traits goes across your your, your entire life. And I bet you, if you think about it, you know, you probably had personality traits that go across your entire life. Uh, this is just part of what this is. <laughs> and here's like a happy little kid. What picture is this? This is on page 518. Woo! There's a kind of grumpy little kid. Emotionality. And there's sociality. And that's what those are. <laughs> and here's a <clears throat> antisocial personality disorder. We're going to talk about this. Um, this is a temperament at age three. So again, it looks like there is something there. But look at the percentages. Again, look at the percentages. Uh, so yes, it's higher. Goes from you know what seven approximately to you know maybe fifteen, a little less than fifteen. So double this one here. I mean, look at that. It doesn't even go up to ten percent. That's getting down to the general population. It's <laughs> the general population. And the thing about this is, what are you going to do about it? I mean, I guess you can do some early intervention. You have people who are age three and see if you can get it down to you know less than zero or you know, whatever. <laughs> so that's interesting. There's a variety of offenses at age twenty-one. This is like less. Less than zero. So, again, I, I, I caution students on these things because it looks like there's something there. You know, if this one goes up to 20%, all right, this goes up to 0.4, so that could like be way up there or something. So, you know, just be cautious when you look at those things. True and be cautious. Uh, and this is a scan people's heads. You see it? Go figure. It's in your brain. So, some various uh, theories of personality. This is more historical, actually. Um, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through them. You want you to know the sort of basics of them, but they don't really, you know, I mean, people still use them, I suppose, but not really that extensively, the personality theory. The Freud, I have to talk about the Freud some. You have this idea of the three, the ego, id, ego, and superego. Id is all the, you know, desires of expressing life forces, all that kind of stuff. Superego is, no, you can't do all that. And ego tries to mix them all together <laughs> somehow uh, get them together and then de by definition the id is completely unconscious so how would you measure that okay <laughs> speaking of psych uh, of uh, science how would you measure it if it's completely unconscious so but this is there some sort of part of his theory id superego and ego talked about that as well uh, so know the different principles they act on want to have pleasure i uh, can't have it everywhere and there's Anna Freud. Um, who came up with the defense mechanisms? These are good. You know, th these are these are useful. <laughs> so denial it ignores medical advice. I can drink 36 beers without barfing. Um, I had a client once who uh, had this baseball-sized tumor, black and blue tumor coming out of her abdomen. It's ovarian cancer. And I asked her, you know, why didn't you get that looked at? And she said, I thought I'd go away. That would be denial. So <laughs> regression. Uh, uh, repression, I mean, excuse me, repression. Don't have my glasses on, better do that so I can actually see. <laughs> the uh, excluding source of anxiety, you know, something horrible happened and you just don't recall it. Uh, projection you'll get. If you go into healthcare, you're going to get some projection onto you. And uh, that's basically where someone, they don't like the qualities in themselves and they'll put them onto you. I feel angry and icky, so I'm going to put it onto you, angry and icky. Um, Reaction formation, uh, warding off uncomfortable thoughts by overemphasizing its opposite. I have kind of a crude story that I put with that one. Um, but, uh, well, <laughs> I tell it I, I tell it all the time, so I might as well keep telling it here, right? Miss, you know, miss, have you guys missed out on my, uh, the, the stuff <laughs> in my stories? Um, so there's a, there's a time I was in emergency room, you know, I think it was an intern, and this guy came in, young guy, probably in his early 20s, had a satanic Bible and, you know, very satanic things on his, on his tattoos on his head, um, smelled, kind of had a lot of body odor, uh, came in with a new onset of low back pain. And we asked him, you know, give, to give him a history and ask him, well, uh, you know, is, do you do anything heavy lifting? And I know some of you are in high school, so I feel kind of hesitant, but, you know, this is college, so you might as well get onto it. And he goes, yeah, I, I lift uh, hamster cages. Well, what do you do with hamster cases? He says, well, I play with them. What he did, <laughs> and this is what you'll see in the world, uh, people will put hamsters in like uh, baggies, insert them into the rectum. Uh, the hamsters become anoxic. They can't breathe and will have a seizure and they get off on that. 
<laughs> Sorry, folks. True story. Uh, so we got all freaked out. We're just going, oh, my God. You know, this guy's, oh, my God. He just couldn't handle this too well. So we said, you low back pain. Welcome to the world of low back pain. Here's some Advil. Please leave now. Next morning, the the uh, our attendant came in and just just really got on our case, really was upset with us. We didn't even get an x-ray, okay, because they're just so grossed out, <laughs> frankly. Um, and uh, so we should have got an x-ray. You know, what we should have done, and we, we got him, uh, we got him called back in. You know, I don't know what happened from there, but we did get acknowledged, got him back in. We should have reacted for Mated, okay? We should have done that. We should have said, wow, um, let's do Let's get everything we can. This guy's kind of going, hey, okay, let's get this go. Let's forget that and do more than what we think is necessary. We should have done that, but we didn't. Rationalization, logical response, other, otherwise being stable. I can do this. Everybody does this. No big deal. Um, and then the displacement. Yeah, th this happens all the time. Uh, you, we get sort of activated. If something happens, we get kind of activated just in general, and we get sort of upset. So we're, you know, we get the, someone doesn't turn their blinkers on going to work. I hate that. I hate that. It's like, come on, people. It's not that hard. It's like, sure. <laughs> but then it kind of irritates me, and so I might be irritable when I get to work. And then sublimation. This one, the sadist becomes a dentist or a surgeon. That's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> they actually want to help people. My dentist is one of the kindest men I've ever met. Uh, extremely intelligent. You know, so that's kind of dumb. But sublimation might be more something along the lines of, I want to play basketball. I'm going to you know, play piano. I'm going to read a good book. Exercise. Do something to help you cope. So, these are good. You'll, 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 if you go into healthcare, you'll see these. Now that you know them, you'll probably realize, see them happening around you. Uh, let's see. I don't know how much I want to focus on these. Again, these are uh, all the different stages, oral, anal, phallic, latency. The whole idea here is that people get stuck in a certain stage. Okay, you get pleasure through the mouth. If you get too much pleasure, you're gullible. In the anal stage, if you get too much stricter training, you have obsessive compulsive disorder, too less, you're a slob. Nothing to bad back in whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the idea. So, yeah, there's lack of science. But he was good. He was an astute observer. And remember, who he studied people with, uh, with the uh, with conversion disorders. And okay? this is what he studied because what he was a neurologist. Freud was a neurologist. So there's this one thing called conversion disorder. Well, people come in with neurological symptoms that can't be explained from the neurological system. Okay. So for example, they may have uh, glove anesthesia for like here down. They can't move their hand and they can't feel it. Okay. So that's what he studied was that and he actually went and studied with Mesmer as a mesmerized hypnosis uh, to try to see if unco unconscious conflict. Well, if that, if that disorder, there often is unconscious conflict. There's unconscious conflict, lots of stuff. Um, but um, So the idea that he had is not a bad idea. It's just these stages, the oral stages and stuff like that, that didn't really didn't really make any sense. Carl Jung, I throw in, speaking of not making sense, <laughs> he actually doesn't have a lot of data either way, although he does have the Myers-Briggs personality uh, test that comes from his work, uh, which has a lot of validity. So uh, he was a student of Freud's and had this idea of both personal unconscious, which is Freud's, you know, okay, that's Freud's id, but also he had this idea of collective unconscious, Ooh, that we have things that are unconscious that are just through the species, you know, so mandalas, we have a picture of those coming in. Uh, the hero myth, where someone born of, you know, meager means, you know, gets taught by an elder, rises above and brings something special back to the population, you know, Harry Potter, you know, Luke Skywalker, all those sort of things are, are common you know, archetypal stories. And that's the idea, it's archetype. So, uh, that these are collective unconscious, they're somehow uh, inherent in our brains per se. Synchronicity, this is where two or more things happen coincidentally, that, that they seem meaningful, that they seem, wow, this is just too weird that these are happening at the same time. They're a causal, one does not cause the other, uh, they just happen at the same time. Now you can get into this quite to quite some extent. <laughs> There's a thing in quantum mechanics called entanglement. What that means is if you have, say, an electron, and you entangle that electron with another electron, and you can separate them theoretically by the you know the, the entire galaxy or something. But the, the Chinese have actually done this for 10,000 kilometers. So it's quite a ways. Electrons have things like spin. They either spin up or they spin down. Okay, so that's a, a property of electrons. So if you have them entangled, take them as far apart as you can. When one spins up, the other one will immediately spin down faster than the speed of light. 
Okay, Einstein didn't think this was possible. Einstein said this is spooky action at a distance. It was actually called, he said that, spooky action, action at a distance, which is kind of a fun thing for him to say. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so, Jung thought this might be tied into this uh, synchronicity, that somehow these things would come together. Now, he actually had a book with Linus Pauling. Uh, I have the book, Letters uh, They Sent to Each Other. It's really kind of thick, so I, have, I haven't read it. Sometimes I collect books and I don't actually read the books. That's whatever. <laughs> um, okay, there, I, I can see that. I've had things like that happen in my life where it just seems just pretty meaningful. Now, but the other thing is if enough things happen, okay, if enough things happen, which lots of things happen, every now and again, two of them are going to seem like they're connected, even though it's just random things. So it's cool. I like it. It's kind of fun to think about. Is it scientifically verifiable? No, it's not. But it makes for good stories. <laughs> Here's the, the mandala. Again, this is from Tibetan Buddhism, I believe. So there's four directions. I better change my colors. Uh, we'll make it uh, black. So the four directions. Sign of the cross. All that kind of stuff. And people will think, well, in a union idea, we'll say it's an archetype. Again, now, this is a psychotic patient that he had that drew one of these, which he thought was evidence for it. It's like, well, maybe. <laughs> so, again, I like it. It's, it's almost more artistic, except for the Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs uh, definitely uh, has a lot of backing to it, uh, but it's just kind of good for movies. <laughs> Going to whip through some of these. Uh, so let's see where we're at in the uh, book. Uh, there's a few. So Carl Jung, we called uh, uh, Alfred Adler. Basically, inferiority complex is what you want to know. Get back to a different color here, green. Inferiority complex is what you get to know. Um, neurotics for Karen Harnay. Contemporary neo Freudians. Object relations, basically, a person's mind and sense of doubt in relation in, uh, to others in the environment. This is one of the reasons that big five personality is kind of sticking around, you know, because basically, a lot of the stuff can be brought into the same thing, <laughs> right? Same idea. They just have different theories for the same thing. Um, and here's for in perspective. I put that in there. We already talked about that. Let's see. Locus of control for Julian Rudder. We have expectancies and values. Internal, I can control my life. External, others control my life. We covered this some in social psychology, right, with the attribution theory. Um, so the same kind of idea. But people with external locus and control as a personality trait uh, tend to have more trouble uh, as far as like uh, alcoholism and stuff like that. However, people with internal locus control will have more depression because they, you know, they see the world for what it is. <laughs> actually, it's what it is. It's actually depressive realism is the term. <laughs> so um, that's the idea. George Kelly, you know, constructs. This is schemas. Again, schemas come back to that. We experience the world and then we view it through that. The schemas and personality, that's what this is. Bandura, we had that person's environment, characteristics, behavior itself. Bandura is kick the crap out of the bubble doll. Okay, what's going on around you, who you are, and they go back and forth. Reciprocal determination, the environment and personality, uh, I guess something like that. Yeah, how about, you know, arrow, you know, arrow, they influence each other. And we're sweeping things here. Well, that I want you to kind of know about. And here's some pictures from your textbook. The expectancy, Julie Rotter. Then this person had an internal locus control, studying in her dorm room, or perhaps her bedroom at home. And here's the Banduras, environment, behavior, personal factors, they all go together. They're pretty happy in this group of people. And humanistic. Carl Rogers, self-actualization. The idea here is that if you have unconditional positive regard as a child, okay, that if your parents can love you no matter what, um, that you can be a fully functional person. Okay, that that means you you have a meaningful life, uh, good relationships, uh, all that sort of healthy, that kind of thing. That's that's his idea. Um, motivational in, uh, interviewing is a type of psychotherapy that comes from Carl Rogers' uh, work, and it's actually been shown to have be quite effective for. A lot of stuff actually diets uh, uh, substance use disorders etc so um, a lot of different things so it's pretty cool um, let's see what else do i want with him oh <laughs> unconditional positive regard this is the you know, 
Uh, you love the kid no matter what. That's the idea. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer does not have unconditional positive regard. <laughs> he had to have his shiny nose uh, guide the sled, the, the sleigh that day. And so uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer does not have unconditional positive regard. <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, we love you but conditionally. <laughs> Here's the positive regard. Little figure kind of drew on the wall. Hopefully that's watercolors. <laughs> So personality types. Yeah, here's this more. So traits. Do we have? Uh, is there, is there a bell curve for everything? Yeah, probably. Um, whoops. Go back. What am I doing? I don't care about updates. Go away. Ah. <laughs> Hopefully, all didn't get that. You probably did. Um, that's squiggle. So big five. Scientifically supported. Goes across control. They're limited, perhaps everything's limited. Everything's limited, but they are they worth they use a lot. So openness to experience. You're imaginative for down to earth, variety, routine, independent conforming, conscientiousness, organized, careful, self-disciplined, or disorganized, careless and weak willed, extroversion, social fun loving and infectious, retiring sober and reserved. So you can see how these definitely uh, sort of work off each other. Now they're various uh, different than each other. And when you think about this, you probably can see how it fits into your life. You, you know people who are like this, you know, because this is, a, you know, it's, again, it's used a lot, ocean, um, extroversion versus introversion. And they're not necessarily one's good versus bad. That's not really the idea. It's just personality traits. Okay? Uh, and they go across you know, a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, psychoticism, let's see. Biological traits, yes, of course they do. Uh, some of these, again, I don't really emphasize because I want to emphasize the things that are cool. <laughs> so this is, a, who is this guy? Uh, this is a Eisenick, whatever. He had all these different things here. But again, really look at the, look what you have. Uh, I don't know what color, I'm just going to use green. So agreeable, aggressiveness, agreeableness, okay? Social, leadership, or, you know, calm, or moody. All these are basically the same sort of idea as these. Okay, so why do we need this? We don't. <laughs> so, introverts, extroverts. Heard a funny thing that you know it's getting bad with the COVID-19 when introverts want to see other people. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's getting bad. <laughs> so, uh, here's the ascending particular system. The textbook talks about this some. Uh, behavioral approach, behavioral intervention, uh, in, inhibition. So, uh, so this is... Uh, Again, from an older textbook. Uh, and here's the signals of reward. So behavioral activation, you want rewards, uh, incentives and rewards. Inhibition, uh, danger or pain and anxiety. You know. This theory always seemed like, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so if you want a reward, you get activated. If you don't want to be punished, uh, you you inhibit. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's lots of Nobel Prizes came from that one. <laughs> I kept this in there. Your textbook doesn't have it. And here we are. This is your textbook. You need to go or stop. <laughs> so this thing is part of the situation or part of the behavior. Again, this goes back to social psychology, right? Attribution theory. Is it who they are or what's going on around them? Same sort of idea. Same idea. Same idea, just in a different context here. Uh, so it's so always centrality to debate, type of trait, etc. Do you monitor yourself or not monitor yourself? If you monitor yourself, your behavior changes for the situation. If you don't, it doesn't. Always an interaction. Again, <laughs> situations and constraining personality. We have there's definitely ways you're supposed to behave in an elevator. Less so in bars. You can have a wider range of behavior in bars. Who knows? Maybe someday bars. I guess people do go to bars, but uh, I, I, I don't. <laughs> it's like, I'm, no, let's wait till this thing gets better. So the interactionism, people are inconsistent. Yeah, this one I think is pretty funny. So the difference between having a meal with his, uh, hope with his lady friend, having some wine, uh, nice little salad, pretty healthy, pretty healthy. Same guy doing karaoke. <laughs> so my former shy in a different situation. So kind of shy there, not so shy there. I mean, that's just starting the wine. That's after a lot of wine. <laughs> Love the mustache. <laughs> and behave one way when somebody's dead. And not so much when they're in a bar. 
<laughs> so this is yeah. So it's kind of interesting here, right? I mean, you don't have funerals now because you don't get all these people together like that, and you don't really have bars crammed together either. You, know, you have fewer people in them. They close early. Figuring this must be in the UK and maybe even Ireland. A lot of looks like Guinness. Can you change? Yeah, some. It takes a lot of work. Uh, not so stable in childhood. Once you get to be middle aged, yeah, it stays around. <laughs> But uh, adaption, basic tendencies, these are all things that are part of who we are. And uh, here's consistency, less so when you're young, more so when you're older. Basically, you're just sort of saying, screw this. <laughs> I'm going to be who I am. It doesn't matter <laughs> what you think, I'm going to be who I am. But again, you know, let's go across there, at roughly 75. Yeah, even uh, this is still, you know, that's probably a little higher, 0.6 or so. So again, you want to make sure you look at uh, where they where they are. I mean, if you look at this, it seems like it goes up, which it does. Uh, but again, you know, there's probably pretty significant from zero to two, you think, uh, to 60 to 73. Go away. What the heck is that? So, more emotional stability. People with personality disorders, like borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder, tend to chill out. It's kind of an interesting thing. They tend to not be as um, you know, personality disordered, for lack of a better term, once they get into their 40s and 50s. So it's, you know, people get more agreeable, more conscientious. And here's uh, conscientiousness as a, uh, you, you get older. But again, this is a really good chart <laughs> to demonstrate the, what I mean. I mean, look at this, Spanish. Yeah. yeah. 10% maybe? Hmm, not much. Now, the British never change, apparently. Uh, here's Turk, the Turks. And the Turks, when you're between 20, you know, <laughs> between 22 and 29, you stop. You know, there's no Turks. Uh, they're probably their journalists at that point. Whoa, oh, that's bad. <laughs> bad, bad joke. Um, in Spaniards, they don't uh, start having any personality till they reach adulthood. So, again, same sort of idea here. All this, uh, I'm gonna get, I don't think there's too much I really want to focus on, uh, other than circumstances are part of it, uh, traits are part of it, uh, and then they interact. Uh, so. so this is an agreeableness. These change. I'm assuming these are, um, you know, these are statistically significant. But wow, look at this. That's like. That's not, not a lot, but I'm assuming they are statistically significant. Go back to uh, chapter th chapter two, chapter two, p-values, okay, S uh, ranges, <laughs> standard deviations, confidence intervals. I'm assuming this has a p-value, you know, probably what, 0 0.05 maybe, so not a lot, yeah, but uh, uh, I'm assuming it does. Same here. Travelers become less neurotic. Uh, let's see, Sudoku, people get better. I don't remember why I even have that in there. <laughs> so this is my training of Sudoku. Um, and uh, where are we here? Yeah, um, increase openness to experience. I like Sudoku. But again, look at these numbers. Okay, look at those numbers. There's like, uh, what, uh, 0 0.27, 0 0.27 change in openness to experience. Here's different levels of the um, oceans across cultures. You can look at the numbers. And so there you have it. <laughs> and here's my bell curves. A lot of overlap here. Not much overlap there. This is a, for psychology in particular, but most, most things will have these bell curves. And you really want to think about how much is different between them. That's really an important and crucial point, actually. So personality assessment, uh, ideographic, it's person-centered. I'm gonna turn the heat up in here, it's kind of cold. Sorry about that, it's kind of it's cooling off in here. And I, I'm gonna clean my, I got a pellet stove and I'm gonna clean it because I'm, so I'm letting it run out. So I'm gonna have to turn on the baseboard heat and oh, First world problems, first world problems here. <laughs> so, 
So this is your uh, individual. Now in abnormal psychology, we do ideographic approaches. OK, we have all this stuff here. Let me get a different color to illustrate the point. Uh, what color do I want? How about yellow, even though it doesn't show up very much? Nice little bell curves. What do you want to do about this person right there? OK, so that's ideographic. So self story, traits, central traits, all this sort of stuff. What's going on with that person? Nomothetic, though, is person to person, so that's more population based. OK, agreeable, disagreeable across populations. That sort of idea. Uh, workers are here. I should respond to that. Excuse me one moment. Sorry again. Uh, life goes on, huh? This is part of this COVID thing. I'm here at my house. We're getting some work done on the house. Have to coordinate with my my wife, and. Uh, because dogs are blah, 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 blah. So anyway, sorry about that. This is a place where in class I would have some fun. And we have you uh, do your self-assessment. Um, it's completely unreliable, completely un, uh, invalid, but it's kind of a hoot. <laughs> so the idea of projective measures is you project your personality onto ambiguous stimuli. That's the idea. So OK, so this thing comes up. We don't really know what it is. We project it. OK, and that that's your personality. Yeah, you know, motivational traits. Uh, poor diagnostic. Uh, they aren't great. <laughs> if they're in the context of a large psychological assessment, you know, it's not just these, but all these other things too, they probably have more validity. And certainly, uh, PhD psychology folks would think, you know, have to say that they have a lot of validity. So I'm probably speaking a little bit out of term. But. So here's a Rorschach. Now, in class, I'd have you, uh, what do you see? I'd go around, and what do you see here? Um, obviously, I'm not going to, but. There's ideas, you know, do you focus on just part of it? Yellow yeah, doesn't show up very well. Let's do purple. You look at the whole thing, you look at the white areas or just the colored areas, all this kind of stuff. You know, people usually see bugs with this one. You do now that I mentioned it, you know, a butterfly in between there, two bug heads with eyes or something. Here's the same one the other way. You get the cards, you can flip them around, do whatever you want, take as much time. That's what it is. This looks like two uh, women sort of pulling apart a bug head. <laughs> You see it now, though, right? So this is this is kind of the point: is making that suggestion puts meaning onto this ambiguous stimuli, and it's, it's nothing actually. It's just a bunch of ink blots. You know, but it's sort of like you know, stairway to heaven backwards. If you get if you primed, you're psychologically primed, you start seeing it. Okay? These look like guitars now. Okay, they well, didn't about two seconds ago, but they do now because I said they look like guitars. That's that's my point of these things, and on and on you go. You know, now what does this look like? Etc. For that, that's the one out of your textbook. This is page 541. And thematic gap perception test. You just basically see these pictures and what's going on. This is a figure 13.24, again, 541. Let's see. On and on, on Q sort. And here's some TAT, thematic gap perception. You know what's going on here. Again, if it was in the class, I'd have you talk about it. You know, kind of people would say what they think is going on. So take a moment, do that wherever you are now. Disadvantage of an online class, but that's OK. You know, here's this guy's tired, right? It's kind of a small bed, didn't get much sleep last night. Or same same sort of idea. Should get much sleep last night just to make sure, you know, having diversity here. <laughs> So <laughs> there's a guy who's tired and the woman is crashed out. Uh, so they're both heterosexual relationships, I would assume. But, you know, so maybe maybe it's not quite as diverse as it should be. But anyway, it's, it's basically a little bit tongue in cheek. There you go, you guys and gals, tongue in cheek. So <laughs> self reports, history data, personal myths, behavioral data. This is all stuff that you can do. Again, the whole idea here is that we can measure personality to some degree. Uh, here's how you neat. Or are you a slob? Okay. Nice night made bed, horrible. And basically, I like saying is, is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, make your bed? Or why make your bed? You're just going to get back in it again. That's a kind of way to think about it. This looks like almost like a hotel, right? <laughs> a place, not just a hotel. 
and then these objective tests. There's personality traits, California Q sort, Minnesota multiphasic personality disorder uh, in inventory. Uh, so let's see. I think that's about all I want to have there. Okay. Here's the MMPI. I talk about this some more. So all these scales, just like 500 some odd questions in the MMPI, and you agree or don't agree. So my face has been on, you know, various magazines. I brush my teeth. People lie to you. I hear voices. All that kind of stuff is on there. Uh, and then with all that, you get it lined up, and you have high, low, high, low of all these different di dimensions. And it does have predictability. It, it does. It is a valid thing. It's just kind of a a long thing to 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 uh, take. Myers Briggs again, Young's work. If you if a lot of people you might have actually taken that. In fact, uh, if you Google this Myers Briggs or the, the Big Five, you can take it online. I don't I don't have students do that as like an assignment because I don't know, it always seem like it's. I don't know if I should have students doing personality diagnoses, <laughs> so it's not going to have it be an assignment, but it's out there. Of course, it's out there. I mean, it's Google. Everything's out there. Uh, it's used in work, so people in work settings may have the have this, and people are uh, I, I, you know, TP, or uh, you know, so this is their personality, or they might be a E, I, uh, TJ, or whatever, uh, and this, this, but it does have predictive ability as well. So, self-concept. Describe yourself. Okay, I would have people do that in class. Um, who are you? What's your schemas? How do you? Who do you? How do you see yourself? Competent, not competent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know me. This is a way that uh, uh, people have uh, thinking. This is William James. Go back to chapter one. William James, way back there, um, he came up with the idea of I know me. I am the self that knows objective parts of me. And here's all this different parts of you. Here's yourself, all this. You could be daughter, sister, type A, nice, uh, like soccer movies, etc. So this is kind of a who you are. Part I throw in. So self and prefrontal cortex, this, uh, let's see, it has a little bit here. It's this uh, figure 13.30. Uh, but this area, so it's this area and this area, uh, correlate with sense of self. So when you're thinking about yourself, what you want to do next, all that kind of stuff, those part of the brain's, uh, brain lights up. So uh, this is a lecture I gave many years ago, actually, at this point in a consciousness class. But it's really interesting that this part of your brain correlates with your sense of self. OK, when you're thinking about yourself, that's what lights up. So here we are. This is basically the same picture you know, from your, well, the same picture from textbook. But get your get your orientation. That part there is this part here. OK, from a different. I keep doing that. <laughs> different uh, uh, angle. So. Are you fun loving at parties, intelligent at work? This is your working self concept, like working memory, right? Things that you're doing like right now, working memory. Uh, so if you're from Helena, you're from, um, if you're if you live in Montana, see some miles from Montana, you live in Helena but versus Butte or whatever. If you're from Montana, if you're in Texas, you live in Montana. They might ask you where in Montana. They might know Montana. And if you're in the Seychelles, uh, then you're from the from the states. You wouldn't say you're from Helena, Montana, when you're in the Seychelles because nobody would know where that is. And I bet you none. Well, maybe there you might. You're pretty damn smart group of students here. It's really impressive. Um, so um, you might know where the Seychelles are. It's an island country in the Indian Ocean, uh, some about one third of the way between Africa and India. Uh, it's sinking because of global warming and uh, climate change, which is sad. They're beautiful. This is one of the funnier slides. <laughs> Students have laughed over this one. Uh, so here's this uh, uh, poor African American guy. All these women are behind him. I am male. Here's the same guy. All these white people are behind him. I am black. <laughs> so in reality, he's thinking, what the hell are these people standing behind me? I'm trying to work on my computer here. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> so it's, I just, I just find this. Funny. It is. This is a funny slide. Um, so, so this. These, there's a couple that go across here, right? So this person is this person. This person is this person. This person um, became, you know, uh, got a lighter skin tone. Yeah, she went down to the other one. Uh, but this is just like this guy. You know, she's like, I don't know. This. This is one of the funnier slides. <laughs> I am male. I am black. What the hell are these people standing behind me for? I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work. <laughs> so anyway, I just think this is like <laughs> so self-esteem, you know, your social regard and your self-esteem, your social uh, sociometer. That's this one here. That self-esteem scores survey. Again, so 
females generally have a lower self-esteem. Look at the numbers. Yeah, look at the numbers. So, I don't know. Here's your possibility of rejection, high self-esteem. Low self-esteem, you think you're going to be rejected more. That's a funny little thing. <laughs> so, terror management theory. I don't know if they have that. Let's see. Sociometry, life outcomes. Yeah, sociometer. This is one of the ones that sometimes just they goes through so many different uh, editions. I, quite frankly, I, I like this and I keep them from other ones. So basically, terror management theory is this idea that you're going to die, right? We're all going to die. Oh my God, it's terrorists. Everyone it's a terror, it terrorizes me, terrorizes me. So do something immortal. Have children. Do something that lasts beyond you. That's the kind of idea. If you remind people they're going to die, they'll do something to make themselves feel better. So you're all going to die. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> so do something good for yourself. Maybe go back to this picture. I wonder what the heck's going on. <laughs> Poor guy. He's got good posture, though. You got to give him that. I mean, that's like really good posture right there. I, mean, I don't have as good a posture as that guy. Uh, high self esteem, you're definitely being happier, of course. Uh, weekly related to objective outcomes, though. Violent criminals have high self esteem. Well, of course they do. Why would they not? <laughs> Screw these other people. I'm going to beat them up. <laughs> so here's the dark triad narcissism psychopathy machiavellianism very oppressive but to make money their leadership and political success and that's something uh, so they have american psychopath uh this is a uh, christian bale actually was a pretty good batman i had argue i think he played a pretty good batman and so uh, that's the dark triad of personality uh, let's see mental self-concept uh, Self-serving bias, social comparison. These are all just concepts that you get to know. Not much I want to talk about those. Um, frequency of statements. So past. Uh, so that's, that's not too much I want from that. And here's your self-concepts in a culture. Collectivist cultures we tend to be tend to be more uh, well. They help each other more. This is actually probably one of the reasons, frankly, that um, you know, the COVID um, pandemic uh, is more contained in like the in the you know, Eastern Asia, you know, China, etc., because they're very much a collectivist, you know, collectivist culture. Uh, and so, you know, whereas in the Europe and definitely in North America and the United States in particular, we're all very individualistic. Uh, so we basically don't don't take in other people as much and we have a lot more people dying <laughs> so this is a uh, this is a, something to keep in mind so okay so i'm going to stop there uh, because it's a good place to stop uh, let's go back to here and i'm going to stop recording and see you in a second for another one